don't take instructions or directions well from others. Yeah, you really better pursue your own business, okay? And I just, I, I just don't deal well with it. It's not that I reject authority, I just, I'm really, really, fiercely, independently minded. Okay, so the traits of an entrepreneur, outgoing, confident, passionate, observant, visionary, determined, listener, frugal, they're savers, high risk tolerance, they're fearless, they're not afraid to fail, they question conventional wisdom, they revisit the rules. So this is interesting, 90% of startups fail. Why do 90% of startups fail? Yes, sir. They're not persistent enough. Interesting? They don't sell what the customer wants. This guy knows NIS, I love him. Yes? I was just going to say they didn't qualify their ideas before they tried Okay. Yes, I am. Up there? I have some research to see if people in the area want it. I can't hear you. Will you yell at me? They haven't done research to see if people will want their ideas before they have started. Thank you. They may not have built something that a customer wanted, right? NIS, I love it. Other hand? Okay, really the reason why 90% of startups fail, guys, is because of the traits of an entrepreneur. That's a peculiar statement, isn't it? But it's true. Because your passion, your vision, your determination, these things can lead to failure. It's really important that you understand if you're passionate about the wrong idea, if you have a vision and your vision is flawed, but you are determined, it is, does you no good to be determined and be passionate about an idea that's not going anywhere. It goes to what the gentleman up there by the railing said, if we're building a product that nobody wants, it's no blame, okay? I hope that a lot of the advice that I share with you guys today, it's real. I am an entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was 13 years old. It was a snow shack. You guys see the little snow cone thing? It was a snow shack. Uh, they never franchised one before. My older brother and I went in and we convinced them to sell us a snow shack. And we would buy their flavors from them. A few years later, they did. Well, not a few years later then. But a few years later, they franchised every single one they had. They no longer opened them on their own. I was 13, my brother was 15. He lasted one year. I ran it until I went on my mission. My father loaned us 3,500 bucks or something to buy. From there I went on, I never worked for anybody. With the exception that I sold several companies. And when you sell your company, you're generally required to go work for somebody, the buyer, for a couple of years. So in those couple of circumstances, I've worked for people and received a paycheck. But other than that, I've signed every paycheck I've ever received. I don't say that to boast. I say that because I am an entrepreneur. That's all I know. I don't know how to work for someone. And I share that because the advice I'm going to give to you guys today, I hope it's real. It's probably a little different than the advice you've got from other people. It's going to be some things that are really basic and pretty simple, but things that I really want you to learn and know because I'm genuinely passionate about entrepreneurism. I want you to be entrepreneurs. It's been such a great thing for me in my life. I'm encouraging you all strongly down this path. It's a good one, okay? So going back to that comment, I put on my list of traits that entrepreneurs are really good listeners. That was an interesting trait of an entrepreneur to put up. But a successful entrepreneur is a good listener. And the reason that I say that is as you go through the NISI process, you guys, when I say NISI, you know what I'm talking about? Your second favorite book. Book of Mormons first, we're at BYU, right? <coughs> then it's nail it, then scale it, okay? You want to be an entrepreneur and you're going to start a business, you want to know that book and you want to know it well. But it teaches us to be 
intellectually honest. And what this means, and we're going back to that statement, some of you know the book and you know it well. We don't just go build a product, run out to market, and see if it will sell. We first come up with an idea. We take that idea out to the market. It's just an idea, it's still on paper. We talk to people, and we find out if they would buy our idea. And we listen really well to what we learn. That is so important, and that step right there, guys, will keep your business from failing, or at least greatly increase your odds that you won't become one of the 90 percenters, okay? All right, so there's your listener. Here's another baby. How many of you have savings? Okay, pretty good number of hands. How many don't? Come on, I need one brave soul to pick on. There we go, thank you. Young lady up there, thanks for admitting. Even if you're just going for fun. Okay, you guys, one of my businesses, in 97, I think, I was sitting at the Thanksgiving table with family members, and my brother-in-law was there, and he was talking about this weight loss bill. Talking on and on and on, and I'm sitting there with my wife thinking, wow, how stupid to sell a weight loss bill. And then he started to talk about the numbers. That's a lot of weight loss bills. And I kept listening. Well, my wife and I, we had a pretty successful window and door business. We had a shipping business. Those were going along there great. They are producing good income for us. And as I kept listening, my mind was churning. And the following morning, which would have been Monday morning, I had one of my employees, who's still a, a partner of mine, I was on the phone with him as I was driving down here today, totally different business. I put him on the telephone Monday morning, and I said, I want you to call every single mall in this country. There's 3,500 back then. I said, I want you to ask them when they pick up the phone, do you have a metabolite card? If they say yes, hang up. If they say no, you get a contract. I want a metabolite card in every single mall in this country that doesn't have one. You know how many we got? 17. It produced millions of dollars. We were bought out maybe a year, year and a half later. And they continued to pay us. I think the contract was two years in the buyout. But I'm going back to this. The reason that we were able to do that was because we had savings. Savers, those who save have, those who have get. You guys, it's so important. Opportunities will come along, and if you have money, you can capitalize. If you don't, you're out. Many students, many people come to me, pitching their ideas to me. So Tanner, my buddy, he comes and he pitches this bottle of water to me, right? And he says, he shows me this business plan, and he tells me how great it's gonna be if we sell these bottles of water. Well, I like it. Water's good. And I'm thinking, this is a pretty good business. And so we get to the end, and Tanner shows me how much money we're going to make. It's going to be this super great investment. And I turn to Tanner and I say, okay, how much you want? How much you want, Tanner? 100 grand. And I turn to Tanner and I say, okay, I put in 100 grand, Tanner. What are you going to put in? Now, Tanner, he's saved up. Four grand, okay? Really, Tanner has a lot more money than that, ladies. Plus, he's really good looking, so he wants to do But let's just say, for example, Tanner saved up four grand. Tanner turns to me and he says, I got four grand. I'll put it all in. So you want me to put in a hundred, and you're gonna put in four. What do you think my response is? I love this guy. No, I mean, I really do, but I love him in my scenario, too. He just offered to put everything he has into the pot. Four grand to Tanner is everything he's saved in his life. <laughs> if Tanner commits everything, how hard is he going to work for our business? It's going to kill himself. 
it will kill himself to make our business succeed. Because four grand to Tanner is a lot of money. You get my point? You guys have to have some skin in the game when you go looking for some money. And if I see you have skin in the game, you're putting it all on the line, I'm going to be much more prone to put 100000 bucks on the line. Please, please, please be savers. Don't be spenders. Spenders get instant gratification. Look at the watch on your hand. Love it. Look at your cool sunglasses. Go drive your cool car. That's your satisfaction. Having the cash to start a business and become very successful and at, age, and at 45 years old, buy a car dealership won't be your option. Okay? I sat with a gentleman this morning. He made an appointment with me. He came in and he said, Corbin, I've got $70,000 saved up. What should I do with it? Nice job. 70,000 bucks, your options are huge. Okay? That's the path you need to be on, guys. All right? Super important. All right, moving along at the speed of God. Observant. I love to pick on you college students because you guys walk around campus with these little things in your ears and you're doing this as you walk around campus, right? You're sitting here and you're walking like this everywhere you go and your thumbs move so fast that people might like can't even fathom it. You gotta put this away and you gotta look up. You gotta see what's going on around you. One of you said being observant. You gotta see the world. You gotta be listening for everything that's going on if you're going to find a pain. What's a pain? Thank you very much. Who can tell me what a pain is? Yes, ma'am. Something someone would pay money to have it fixed. Bingo. It's that simple. You guys, entrepreneurs hear a phrase, and we just go nuts. Whenever somebody says, that is such a pain in the neck, and the more they're angered by it or frustrated, the more money we're going to make Okay? So we love it when we hear somebody say, oh, that is such a pain. Normal people, they just go on. It's a pain, you have to deal with it. Not entrepreneurs. We are bound and determined to solve the problem and make money. Okay? So then it comes down to, is our pain a vitamin or a painkiller? Okay? Is it a mosquito bite? or a shark bite. It's really important. In NISI, it talks about a, a vitamin or a painkiller. Do you take vitamins every day? No. Is it essential? Could be. It's pretty much optional, right? If you go have your wisdom teeth pulled out, are you going to take painkillers? Let's think of something more painful than that. Let's look at it. Oh, I had a hernia fix. That was so painful. You go get a hernia fix, you get to take painkillers? You better. <laughs> you better, unless you're one of those women that wants to have your baby naturally. You better take the painkillers. Okay? My point is the painkiller is essential, right? And this is where, this is the spectrum in which we look at pains. Is it optional? Is it kind of whole hum? Maybe. Or will do I absolutely have to take it, have to address it, whatever. The more we get toward this end of that spectrum, guys, the more money we're going to make and the more successful our idea is going to be. Okay? A few lessons for you for along this journey of being an entrepreneur. Number one is balance. Okay? To my class, you see this pop up on the screen like the last three class periods, but we never got to it. You need these five areas of your life in my, yes please. You need these five areas in your life in balance. If you were to get rid of one of those areas in life and say, I'm okay to have that out of balance, which one would it be? Which one? School, I like that. Yeah, here we are sitting in a school and you're willing to give up school, that's good. I like it. But seriously. Which one could be given up? It's not an easy answer, is it? Nobody's blurting out an answer. 
flung water on a limb. I'll torture you as soon as you say something. Yes, sir. Oh. What? Oh. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I love it. Why would you give up help? That's the one you can't take with you. Okay, then take it with you. But your journey's going to be a lot shorter if you don't have it. <laughs> I like it. You went out on a limb. One of those traits of an entrepreneur, guys, is being extroverted. And that means you have to talk. If you don't talk, you're going to have a tough time being an entrepreneur. You've got to get outside your shell. You're going to have to sell. You're going to have to do all those things sometime. And so it's about being an extrovert. So my point with this is, guys, there's not too much that we can give up here. Now look at your lives. How well are we in balance right now? Well, let me pick on it. Red shirt. Man, that really looks like a Utah shirt. So I picked on you for a reason. That's all red and white and black. But I still like it. Okay? How are you doing with work? Balance? Doing okay? Kinda. Family? Married? Nope. You ever talk to your family back home? Sometimes. Good. Good. Health? Eating good? Fruits and veggies? Ten a day? Two a day? Good. Six bottles of water? All your vitamins? Okay. How about school? Maybe a little imbalanced on this one. If everything were supposed to be 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, how are we doing on school? Like 70? Right? That makes it kind of tough to get everything else in balance, doesn't it? And lastly, spirituality. Spirituality tends to take the back seat a lot of times. Family tends to take a back seat. I realize that as you guys are students, in this scenario right here, school is really in balance. But what I want to share with you, the important message I'm trying to get across to you today, guys, is as entrepreneurs, there will become a different imbalance in your life. You absolutely must guard that this right here doesn't become 70%. It's really important. Why did you become an entrepreneur? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Yes, sir. So the focus on things that matter most. I like it. Uh, so I don't have to work. So you don't have to work. What does that mean? Uh, other people will help. Uh, you know, do your work for you. You're going to be the boss. Okay, I like it. Yeah. Who else? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Come on, extroverts. Create your own schedule. I love it. You work 14 hour days. Yes, sir. The creative and open environment. What? The creative and open environment. Okay, you want to be in a creative and open environment. Yes, sir. Do something I'm passionate about. Okay, because you're passionate about it. Yes. Live a comfortable life. Live a comfortable life. Could you put that into other words for me? Okay, that's it. Okay. Okay. Finally, somebody's honest with me. Just because we're at BYU, you guys, you know, we can we can say we want to make a lot of money. When I was sitting in your seat, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Cut and dry. I was a student here in fall of '87. Went on mission. Came back in '90. Nothing else on my mind. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had very specific goals, um, which I won't share. But I almost did. <clears throat> but yeah, I had very specific goals of what I wanted to do, and it was to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to be independently wealthy. Now, my goals have changed vastly since then, but that's why I was here. That's why I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Is that wrong? My wife and I teach entrepreneurism in several countries around the world uh, to return missionaries. These are people who live in poverty and the plan is to help them start a business so that they can reach their way out of poverty. The program is called ACE, or the Academy for Creating Enterprise. This is a tangent. The reason that I'm sharing this is one of the first things we have to do when we go to these countries is we have to help these people overcome the concern that it's okay to make money. 
They believe money is evil, and they don't want to make money because it's evil. And so we start with the fact that it's okay to make money. All right, so thank you for being honest and admitting. You want to be an entrepreneur and make money. That's okay. I'm telling you something. With most jobs, your income is capped. There are limitations. With an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur, you have much more opportunity to break through those barriers. Okay, but going back to the point that I was making right here on balance, there's a great quote by President McKay, President David O. McKay, that states, this will be on your final, by the way. I don't give you a final, but this will be on your final. No success can compensate for failure in the home. Go make all the money you can. Stockpile it. No problem. You buy a Lamborghini, I'll come find you. Okay? That's not what you do with your wealth. You help people with it. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the key is, guys, don't be successful at the cost of your family. Every day, everywhere, I see examples of that, where people got too caught up in their business in their success and in their wealth, and that took precedence over their family. And they are unhappy, okay? Super, super important thing. All right, so have balance. You guys, you need to keep this. This right here sits on my desk at home, and this is my reminder. You guys know what this is called? Newton's cradle, okay? This sits there, and it just sits there to remind me. I think it's cool, everybody that comes in likes to play with it but it's there to remind me to keep my life in balance. Those five areas right there, except for school, I don't have school on mine. You get to replace that with social life. <laughs> you guys go ahead. You start having fun again. All right, but that has to be in balance, guys. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is integrity. There is a, it's now retired, but Clayton Christensen, we've all heard of Clayton. Professor at Harvard, he's LDS. Clayton wrote a book called How Will You Measure Your Life? And I love something that Clayton teaches in that book. He says, well, first of all, how he came about these three points that I'm gonna give you. He said, I, after I graduated from Harvard, got his MBA, he said, I kept going back to my class reunions. And as I would go back to my reunions, the more years that went by, the more strife that I started to witness in my classmates' lives. Divorces started to appear. Dysfunctional children started to appear, and I started hearing stories about them. And he said, then the further we went, the more egregious the problems became. And so Clayton would finish his class every day by teaching these three principles. Number one, Wow, that slide turned out great. Each and every day, guys, work diligently to be happy in your career. So many people choose a career because their father did. Okay? Do you really love accounting? Or are you doing it because your dad did? Now, if you love counting beans, that's all cool. And by the way, entrepreneurs, having a good knowledge of accounting can be super beneficial. I'm not ripping on accountants. <laughs> I'm not ripping on But be happy in what you do. Think about the amount of time you're going to spend at your job. The vast majority of the rest of your life is going to be spent at your job. Monday through Friday, from eight till five, approximately, you're going to be working. I love what I do. I genuinely love doing what I do, whatever it is I do. It's so much fun. Be sure you love what you do, even if it's a job. Be sure you pick a profession, and thus a major that leads into a profession, of something that you love. Why be unhappy? Why spend all that time for the rest of your life with something like counting beans? If you don't like counting beans, if you do, great. That's my point. Yeah. 
right? So be happy in your career. Number two, he tells them, have quality family life. A tip for you on this, guys, my father-in-law, my family's here with me today, my daughter, my wife, and my half stepdaughter kind of friend thing. <laughs> what were we talking about? How can I down there? My father-in-law told me this. He said, treat Saturday like Sunday. Saturday is family day. That's really good advice. Leave Saturdays for your family. Don't go to your computer. Don't take your work home. Leave that day. Another one, guys, is when you get home, don't go into your den, don't go into your office and keep working. When you get home, Give that time to your family. That's their time. Don't cheat them out of it. That will help you have a quality family. Okay? And finally, I love this last one. Where'd it go? Stay out of jail. So as Clayton continued going on and on to his back to his class reunions, more and more of his classmates started to not be there because they were in jail. Now, we're LDS, so we're immune to that, right? No. No, guys. Ponzi schemes in Utah were the capital of Ponzi schemes. Are Ponzi schemes dishonest? Well, yeah, they put people in jail for them. They must be. Stay out of jail. There is no transaction and there is no amount of money worth risking jail time. Come on. Read the paper every day. Read about them. It's just crazy how stupid people are when they let their greed take over. Yes, sir. Giving up education. Uh, no help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's common like that, right? It's yeah. The what? The Barton Stewart case. The what? The Stewart case in jail, right? It's what a great right? example. She had all the money in the world. Why cheat to get ahead? That was an insider trading deal. What? She's going to make a little extra money? Totally destroyed a brand that's still there. But it took a huge hit on a brand that was so mega. Mega. I'm sure she would tell us. There's no question she would tell us. It wasn't her. Okay? Alright. So, lessons for a long journey. How are we doing on time? Am I supposed to be done at 415? 10 minutes? Okay. Lastly is to give back. You guys, I spend a lot of time with students working with them to develop companies, to develop their products. I give my time free to these students that I meet with. Matthew, will you stand up and tell people what my hourly rate is? It just, he helps a lot, just so I can, he says, pay it forward, just help someone else when I make it. Okay, and so what I want you to do, his answer was pay it forward. And I wasn't saying that to boast, I'm trying to make a point. And that is, guys, when you start your company, I want you to figure out a way to give a portion of your proceeds to a very good cause. Let me give you an example of the power of what I just taught you, okay? This right here was one of my companies. It was a handbag company. There's, is there a paint with handbags? Yeah. Women, they like their handbag to match their outfit. And so they're constantly changing their bag, which means dumping all their goodies out, scooping them up, putting them in another bag to run out the door. See, I'm getting heads nodding. Thank you, women, you're validating for me. Scooping their stuff up, putting it in another bag to run out the door. Is that a pain? Yeah, probably just like a mosquito bag, right? Davis, you got running on that one. Davis, are you here? So a young lady in West Valley City came up with this idea, well, what if I can leave all my stuff inside my bag and just take off the exterior? And as I take off the exterior, I can put on a new one, and I go from whatever color that one was to this one's clearly orange. Okay, and it totally changed the look of my bag so quick, so easily. Well, it wasn't the company or the concept that I wanted to show you. We started that in 07, by the way, grew to 75 million in annual sales in 2010 during the recession. So it must not have been a mosquito bite. Okay? But anyway, my point is this. We took one of these exteriors, 
But we said, we're going to call this one. It's not this one. We're going to call this our Hope Shed. And every time somebody buys this one, it said Hope all over on it, we're going to donate the profits from this exterior to cancer research. We're a pretty small company when we say we're going to do this. In our first year, let's see, I think that was actually 2010, we donated $705,000 to cancer research. The following year, it was over a million dollars. Why was that so important to our company? Why don't you Way back there. Way back then. It gives your employees incentive to feel like they're working toward a better cause than just, than just an income. Okay, employees felt like they were working toward a better cause. I like that. Why else? Yes? Buy-in said it got buy-in from both employees and customers. Yes, ma'am? If you are selfish to the world, the world will be selfish for you. All of these comments are so beautiful. That got people behind our company like nothing I've ever witnessed before. Everybody that would buy, when you buy this bag, you generally don't buy the bag in one exterior. Right, that defeats the purpose. There's nothing to change out. So you would always buy the bag in three or four exteriors. Every single person would always choose one of their three or four exteriors to be a hope shell. And what that told our customers, Michi was the name of this company. Michi was a company that cared. We were a company that gave back. We were a company that took what we received and gave back to the community. Cancer in particular, <clears throat> connected with almost every person out there. And so it resonated with them and it made them passionate customers of ours. Yes, sir. There you go. People are out advertising for you because of this. So guys, when you start your businesses, it's really important that you look for a way to give back. Don't do it to grow your business. Do it because you care. Pick something that means something to you. My dad died in January of 2007 of pancreatic cancer, and that happened to be the month before I was introduced to this product. It was very raw for me. It was right there. It was an emotional thing for me, and so cancer was an easy one for me to fit. Be sure you do this. So what I was talking to Matthew about, when I work with my students, I tell them, I'll give you my time and what I expect from you in return give your time, you give your learnings, and you give some of your profits to an important cause out there. There are lots of them. And as entrepreneurs, guys, we cannot be selfish. We have to share what we have. It's just, it's important. Okay? All right. I think we're almost done. Journey's end. You guys, as you get to the end of this journey, be sure that you've had fun. Be sure that the path that you chose was for profits. I love that, there's nothing wrong with it. What I try to leave with students, because you guys are sitting there at the time of starting businesses, get on that path and head toward a journey for the purpose. Sure, it's okay to make money, but what I want you to remember, it's what you do with the money that matters. Don't have a Lamborghini in your plans, and don't ever add it in. You don't need to drive a Lamborghini. There are lots of great cars that cost one-tenth as much money. There's a lot of people that need that help and that's the better way to spend your money and what to do with it after you all become phenomenal entrepreneurs. So what I started with, well, there's a great quote from John Christman. He's a hero, he's a youth, and we still love him. Okay. Selfless giving unto others represents one's true wealth. And you guys shoot with the stars in everything you do. Don't set low goals. Go for the big ones, okay? Yes, yeah, same quotes as last semester. They're never going to change, you guys. Shoot with the stars. Go big, okay? In everything you do. Extraordinary.
Thanks, guys.